Hello, I'm Arthur Brandwood. I am the founder and principal consultant of Brandwood Biomedical and welcome to this June 2017 edition of the Brandwood Live webinars where today I'm going to be talking about the implementation of the new European medical device regulations and in vitro diagnostic device regulations. So we're off. Last May, a few weeks ago, the European Union finally published the new regulations in the official journal, setting in place a transition period of three years for medical devices and five years for IVDs. So what does it all mean? Well, we're based here in Sydney. We are headquartered in Sydney. We have offices in China. We're in the process of um, establishing new offices in Japan and Taiwan. Um, we support companies coming into this part of the world, but also many of our clients go the other way. Asia Pacific companies heading off to the United States and to Europe. And of course, all of these regulatory jurisdictions, whether they're here or whether they're in the West, are linked. There's a global harmonization process in place and more and more regulators look to each other. So it's important to understand how regulations change and how they affect other jurisdictions. And certainly um, we're very aware of that here in Australia where we have a regulatory system that's closely based on the European one and the changes in Europe will have implications here as they will in many other places as uh, the Australian regulatory framework uh, will need to continue to adapt to ensure continuing harmonization. So uh, today we're going to look at Europe to look at what's just happened here. Um, we're going to say what's just happened with the implementation of the new regulations. What does it mean? How long have you got? How long have I got to adapt to this and to make sure I comply with the new regulations? What are the key changes that have taken place? And just as importantly, what's not changed? What's stayed the same? What do you need to know and do and when? And finally, we might just look at a few traps along the way for the, for the unwary. So uh, many of you have been losing sleep, losing sleep about these weighty documents that have just been published, the two regulations uh, with many hundreds of pages of new regulation there, and uh, what does it all mean? So what did just happen? In May, the, the two new regulations were gazetted in the official journal. We're off, that sets off the race. There is a transition period, as I said, three years for the medical devices, that includes active and med uh, implantable medical devices, and five years for IVD regulations. So the old three directives have now become two. The active implantable directive and the medical device directive have been merged into one single regulation and IVDs are now on their own. But what's not changing? If we look at the regulatory model, what's not changing are the basics. The, we still have essential requirements, although now they're a lot more detailed and they're called safety and performance um, requirements. Um, we still have a risk-based classification scheme, although we'll see there's been some adjustments to that. We still have third-party assessment and notified bodies, but one of the big changes is the level of governance, the level of supervision of notified bodies has considerably stepped up and all notified bodies are going to require to be redesignated to the new requirements. That's going to cause quite a shakeout and I'll talk about how that will affect regulation and, and the, uh, the regulatory process. We still have Regulatory reviews which are based on risk. The amount of review and the involvement of the notified body increases with the risk classification of the device and we still have use of harmonized technical standards. That's hardly changed at all, although the range of standards has slightly expanded in the new regulations and just things like in, uh, includes the European Pharmacopeia. But the key thing is that the fundamental European regulatory model is unchanged. And for those of you who are fans of the late Douglas Adams, don't panic. OK, it's um, a new system, but surprisingly much like the old. So let's just look at what's actually changed in the medical device regulation. Firstly, we now have the safety and performance requirements, the general safety and performance requirements, as they're called. They are the old essential principles that we've all learned to know and love, but with more detail. And we'll talk about that in a moment. We have updated classifications, which have caused some devices to move into new classification. Uh, mainly devices are up classified and a range of new class three devices and a few other clarifications. Not much has moved down. That means more data. We have more information required to meet the safety and performance requirements and more devices are going to be at a higher level with a higher expectation for data.
Clinical evaluation, this is the big change in the, uh, in the application of the regulations. There is much more emphasis on clinical evaluation, especially for the higher risk devices. Uh, there's a great deal more detail expected in clinical evaluation reports uh, and in the clinical evidence files and expectation of a much wider participation in that process. And there is this thing called scrutiny. The scrutiny process um, involves for some high risk devices an extra layer of review. So the notified bodies review report gets set off to an expert panel who provide a final level of input and recommendation. And it's also possible for manufacturers to go and seek the advice of the scrutiny panels um, if they're planning things like large clinical trials. Although it remains to be seen how well that will work because the advisors on those panels are not the people making the final regulatory judgment. And so whether um, uh, that's going to work in terms terms of uh, providing realistic advice that will then stick in the regulatory process is yet to be seen. But what that does mean is that we're going to see stricter reviews. Finally, um, post-market surveillance, there are much more strict requirements on post-market re surveillance and particularly a couple of new reports that have to be generated and these are externally reviewed for the higher risk devices. So expect to be spending a lot more time um, with a lot more rigor on post-market data and reviewing of those data. And then we have uh, a much uh, increase in transparency. What does that mean? In Europe, it means Udemed. Udemed is what? It's a big database. Um, at the moment, there are a number of national databases for registration of medical devices supplied in Europe. They are simply administrative databases. They don't involve any further technical review. But the aim is to replace all of those national databases with one pan-European database, which will contain an awful lot of information. Um, and we'll talk about that. But simply put, the, uh, the greater requirements for post-market surveillance and the greater requirements for submitting information to the Udemed database means that there's going to need to be continuous post-market vigilance, continuing regulatory review and monitoring of products after they've had their initial um, approval. So let's just look at a few of those things. We'll start with the Annex 1 general safety and performance requirements. As I said, they really are the old essential requirements. They're the same things. They have pretty much the same structure. The numbering's changed a bit, though, as we've added some new things in there. But let's just look at what the key changes are. Firstly, software. Software, including standalone software, now has its own section in the general safety and performance requirements. And those... Um, Requirements address things that we already know, so they call upon uh, um, the software lifecycle standards. So if you're familiar with IEC 62304, the software, medical device software lifecycle standard, or the human factors guidances and standards that go along with software, that we know and love and uh, we're, we're well, well familiar with. Um, but in addition to that, there is content in the essential uh, safety and performance requ requirements on privacy and cybersecurity. So that now raises its head in the regulations for the first time. Um, and you are now required to comply with appropriate European privacy regulations if you have software, which, for example, contra contains uh, patient identifying information and your devices uh, need to be appropriately designed uh, for cybersecurity to prevent interference or, or um, uh, malfeasance. So uh, new approaches to software. Uh, devices with medicines or biologicals um, have new requirements um, and uh, that uh, it, uh, will step up uh, the expectations in terms of reviews, in terms of uh, qualification of the medicines and in terms of risk assessment for the biologicals. Biological safety, that section is enhanced considerably. So uh, in addition to the old uh, uh, very uh, uh, basic requirements of compliance with uh, biological safety standards largely set in, in ISO 10993, there's now a host of quite specific detail on things like uh, labeling uh, or, or um, exclusion of specified carcinogens, um, labeling and identification of phthalates um, and endocrine disruptors and um, risk management to justify the presence of those, of those substances if they are there. Uh, the labelling itself has a whole new chapter now. So the uh, chapter three of the general safety and performance requirements, chapter three of Annex one, um, deals with labelling and information supplied with the product and uh, quite a bit more detail in what's required there.
Um, as I mentioned before, standards um, is, are still referred to, um, but now we have ability to also call upon the European Pharmacopeia um, as an additional harmon um, default harmonized standard. Um, we're also going to see um, these uh, common technical specifications, which are um, uh, going to be some sort of uh, document written by the Commission where there are no existing product standards, but yet we have to see how that's going to work out. Um, risks. One of the things that's now explicit here is that uh, for devices which are used by uh, untrained professionals, in other words, sort of over-the-counter devices used by members of the public, you now have to explicitly um, address and consider the risks associated with lay use of the device in your risk assessment processes and designs. And finally, um, the uh, whole section on sterilization and disinfection and cleaning has expanded. Um, we now introduce this notion of the microbial state of the device and doing risk assessment um, and linking uh, your processes to the claims about the microbial state um, and showing uh, that you can effectively both clean and either disinfect or sterilize the product. Classifications have changed. You'll see there's an existing, there's an extra one and there's one missing. So active implantable medical devices, active implantable medical devices are now merged with class three and essentially treated in the same way. That's really um, following the model used in other, some other jurisdictions. In Australia, we've um, uh, since 2002 have merged active implants uh, with class three and treated them as one uh, similar class for the purposes of conformity assessment. Um, there are a whole bunch of additional class three devices. All of these things have been up classified to class three, so surgical meshes. Um, that, those have been in the news, of course, a lot over the last couple of years, and now they're class three devices in Europe. Spinal implants um, uh, have been up classified to join um, uh, all of the uh, load bearing joints as class three devices, with the exception of uh, straightforward screws and plates, which remain as 2B. Now we have IVF media and other media for transplant organs or, or tissues um, are now all class three devices. Anything in contact with the, um, the heart or the central circulatory system now becomes class three, regardless of the duration of contact. In the old regulations, um, short term uh, uh, contact um, had lower classifications. That's no longer the case. Um, there's a specific mention for the first time of nanomaterials uh, with high potential for internal exposure. And it'll be interested how that phrase gets interpreted. Nanomaterials with high potential for internal exposure, in other words, implantable or nanomaterials that might end up at staying in the body um, become class 3 and other nanomaterials are 2b or 2a and then finally um, active devices with significant patient management function and what that means an example is given is an, um, an automatic external defibrillator anything which has a high risk um, associated with its function uh, with regard to patient management also ends up in class 3 Software, um, interesting change in the software classification here. So um, many of you will be familiar with the software risk classifications that exist in the IEC 62304 standard um, and also in the United States FDA um, software guidance. Uh, there we have a classification into um, in FDA parlance um, uh, low, intermediate and major levels of concern and um, class ABC uh, in the uh, in the IEC standard. The idea is that as the software risk goes up, um, greater levels of validation are required. Well, the new European classification for medical devices elegantly integrates those risk classes into the device classification and soft and classifies software at elevating the risk according to its level of concern or its uh, software risk class in the standard. So those things are integrated together. Uh, there are some clarifications. Wound dressings now is a bit of extra language where it used to just talk about devices in contact with skin. It now also adds mucous membranes to make it clear that the, the classification rules around wound dressings and skin contact devices also apply to devices in contact with the mucous membranes. There are clarifications again coming back to software for medical device data systems. Um, this has been an area of confusion for a long period of time. So devices which connect to other diagnostic 
medical devices, so things that are making diagnostic measurements, uh, there may be devices which then move that information around. So for example, um, devices for telemedicine that may uh, connect with something like an ECG and shift the information from the ECG to a remote location um, for display on a screen where it may be reviewed by a clinician or an x-ray image or something like that. Um, it, it's never been quite clear whether the devices that move the information that's then used in diagnosis are themselves diagnostic devices, but this is now clarified. It says a device is considered to allow direct diagnosis when it provides the diagnosis by itself or when it provides decisive information for diagnosis. In other words, if you've got some algorithms in there that are processing the information before presenting it to the user. Um, but if it's simply taking information from one place to another, then that um, medical device data system is not considered a diagnostic device. So that's a useful bit of clarity there. Um, there's a new class one subset. We're well aware of class one sterile and class one measuring function devices. Now we have a class one R, I think it'll be called class one R, um, reusable surgical instruments. So those uh, devices, surgical instruments, which are intended to be reusable, now will require um, review of conformity assessment by a notified body with specific um, focus on the cleaning and sterilization only. In other words, not a complete review, but the notified body will need to look at the validation of cleaning and sterilization for reusable surgical instruments. And finally, um, custom medical devices. Uh, in a number of international markets, uh, it has been the case for a little while now, the custom devices, if they are actually mass produced, in other words, if somebody sets up a factory to turn out prescription custom devices for multiple patients um, uh, in, in a mass production uh, environment, uh, those devices um, have to be subject to full regulatory review, whereas uh, previously in Europe, um, as is the case here in Australia still, um, custom devices were exempt from pre-market review um, or external scrutiny of their conformity assessment. Um, now, uh, custom devices, if mass produced, must be classified and regulated accordingly. So that brings Europe into line with the United States and with Canada. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens here in Australia, where at the moment we do not have that um, provided to, um, to bring mass-produced custom devices uh, into regulation. And with the advent of so much 3D printing, in particular for implantable medical devices, um, there's certainly going to be a lot more focus on custom medical devices, uh, particularly at the higher risk end. Turning to in vitro diagnostics, there are new classification rules in the IVD regulations, which are completely different to the existing list A and list B and home use classifications that exist in the IVD directive. So the IVD regulations have a four tier classification system um, where the diagnostic test is classified according to the risk associated with the test outcome. Now I wanna make clear that the technology used to get the result doesn't matter. The classification rules are completely agnostic as to how the technology works to deliver a, a, a test result. What matters is what you do with the result and the amount of risk for either the individual who is uh, the subject of the test or the public risk um, where we're talking about things like uh, tests for um, communicable diseases where it really matters that a particular test is effective at um, screening a population, for example. Um, so we have a classification system from one to four, and as the both the public and personal risk accelerates, then you can see higher risk classifications. Now, the key thing here is that class two is the default. So if a device doesn't fit in any of these other classifications easily, um, then class two becomes the default. Um, at the moment in Europe, very few IVDs are subject to pre-market review to conform with the assessment um, by notified bodies. Um, under the new classification system, almost all IVDs will be class two or higher. And so that entire industry is now going to be subject to um, a, uh, a technical review um, at a much higher level. Um, and if you want to have a read about some of that and what that means, take a look at this article on our website. Um,
because we point out that just as the Europeans gazetted the IVD regulations and, st and fired the starting gun on the transition of five years in Europe, Australia was just coming to the end of a similar transition period um, for its IVD regulations and, I and Australia has implemented exactly the same classification rules for some years now. And what's been the learning here? Well, uh, simply put, um, the uh, shift of so many diagnostics from unclassified and with no pre-market review into suddenly requiring clinical evidence and full um, pre-market um, e examination was very challenging and it led to quite a shakeout and, and particularly a number of low volume uh, IVDs were withdrawn from the market and uh, certainly in the early days of this transition uh, there was concern over things like uh, adequate um, uh, variety of supply for uh, IVDs uh, use for example to screen the blood supply and would there be uh, sufficient security over the national blood supply um, so there was some interesting uh, uh, risk assessments going on in the early days there. There's been certainly quite a, a shakeout and a streamlining of the supply in IVDs in Australia and I'm sure similar sort of effects are going to be seen in Europe although it is a bigger market and so you may not get quite so much um, um, reduction in, in variety. Um, turning now to clinical evidence, this applies both for medical devices and IVDs. Um, there's been an update to the MedDev guidance. The MedDev 2.7.1 is now at revision 4 and the latest revision is a very substantial change. Um, all of these things are now in the new guidance document and they all underpin the much greater expectation for clinical evidence in the new regulations. Uh, the guidance at the beginning uh, includes detailed uh, review guidance for notified bodies. So if you want to know the sort of things that your notified body is going to be looking for when it evaluates your clinical evidence file, go look at MedDev 2.7.1 because it's all in there. You can see the review guidance and uh, you're being told right up front what sort of questions you would expect. Um, there's much more specific requirements on how often you have to update medical uh, device and IVD clinical evidence. Um, and again, that's risk-based. So the class three devices, for example, you're expected to review things annually. Um, and that's quite explicit. Um, the concept of equivalence, really borrowing from the 510k paradigm in the United States, the co concept of uh, considering equivalence with predicate devices um, is now buried here, uh, embedded in the, in the clinical evidence guidance. And that equivalence needs to be looked at from multiple aspects, not just in the direct clinical performance data, but is the device equivalent to other uh, um, established safe devices in terms of things like mechanical and biological safety. So from your preclinical data is your device equivalent to other established safe devices in the market and that equivalence needs to be done in reference to devices that are either approved in Europe or if they are not approved in Europe but they're approved in other um, uh, uh, significant markets such as the United States then you have to justify um, that the use of those devices is equivalent to what would be expected in Europe. Um, lots more information on the kind of documentation that's expected, including the plans for doing this, the protocols and methods for doing clinical evaluation, how to do literature searches, all of that sort of stuff. When you can use non-European data, as I've just re remarked on, um, and uh, how active the periodic updates must be. And uh, then uh, what expertise needs to be brought to bear? Now here in Australia for some time, we've had a requirement that hasn't existed in Europe uh, where clinical evaluation reports must be signed off by a, by a clinical professional uh, experienced in the use of the device. Usually a doctor, but not always. You can have a, a nurse or a paramedic or some other clinical professional if they are the appropriate user of that device who may be um, expected uh, to know how it's used. So we, for example, um, had conformity assessments with a clinical evidence report signed by a, a, an ambulance paramedic for a portable incubator for use in our ambulances um, or for a nurse who's looked at dressing packs for use in the, in, uh, in the open hospital ward. Um, but clinical expertise uh, in the MedDev 2.7.1 means more. It means that this now has to be a team approach and there is an expectation of both um, product specialists, engineers, scientists, um, uh, librarians and uh, technical writers who are going to who are going to know how to do pro proper literature searches and of course clinical expertise. So the 2.7.1 talks about a team being used to prepare the clinical evidence guidance and if that doesn't 
drive home what a significant change this is. This is no longer a single report written by a product specialist. It's quite a different exercise. And there are some detailed guidance on how to do um, literature researches and what sort of information sources to use. And uh, we see the concept of level of evidence coming in. Now, this is something that's been very familiar in the pharmaceutical space for a long time, but now we're seeing um, uh, specification of the value of different types of evidence and of course the sort of um, uh, the gold standard being randomized controlled trials which of course you can't often see with medical devices it's difficult to do blinded trials with a medical device um, um, and case series and other simple simple anecdotal observations being considered very much uh, lower level and less less um, less powerful form of evidence. So as you can see a lot of changes in clinical evidence and that's the really big technical change in the review. Now let's just turn to what's going on in the post-market space. Um, again, in the clinical area first, um, there's now an expectation for much more post-market clinical follow-up of medical devices. And it's required and mandatory in a number of cases, and here they are. So if you have a particularly innovative product and you are looking to um, uh, maybe uh, get some special treatment because you've got an innovative product, well, the other side of that coin is for new technologies um, post-market clinical follow-up follow is mandatory. If there is a significant change to your device, you're expected to follow up the, impl the impact of that change on clinical performance. Um, if you have high product-related risks, in other words, high-risk devices, class three devices, implants, and so on, post-market clinical follow-up is mandatory. Um, High-risk anatom anatomical locations and target populations. So that means things like um, orthopedic implants, uh, things in contact with cent central uh, nervous system, central circulatory system, class three devices, in other words, again, uh, post-market clinical follow-up. Um, if you see new information emerging on safety of performance that's unexpected, what does that mean? Let's monitor the device in the market. Um, if you have not used um, direct clinical evidence. In other words, if your device doesn't have direct clinical study data supporting it, but in fact you've, you've established clinical um, evidence based on equivalence with other similar devices, then post-market clinical follow-up is mandatory. Um, so that's going to raise the requirements for quite a lot of devices because many of the lower risk devices, of course, don't have direct clinical studies, but you are expected to monitor in the post-market how your device works. And if you have unanswered questions on long-term safety and performance, and the best example there are things like um, long-term implants such as uh, total joints, where um, the performance lifetime of devices may now be measured in decades, and yet the development lifetime is measured in years and so uh, those devices we are now going to expect to see long-term monitoring in the field and that's already the case in most places. I referred before to Udemed and um, here's a slide, um, not my slide, I um, I've re reproduced this with permission from um, uh, from Basil Acker at Tuf Sud. Um, Basil um, uh, <laughs> makes a very good point here that uh, the new regulations um, have a, quite a number of requirements for communication, both in terms of reviews, in terms of checking by notified bodies, in terms of designation of notified bodies by competent national authorities, um, communications between manufacturers and uh, market representatives and other economic operators such as distributors and importers. And all of this is going into the Udemed database in one form or another. Um, this database is going to be mammoth. It's going to capture uh, information about who all these players are. It's going to capture information about all the different devices that are entering the market. It's going to capture information about clinical evaluation, about reviews, about post-market follow-ups. And there will be varying levels of access. So the competent authorities authorities and the notified bodies are going to get to see a lot. Um, individual manufacturers will be able to see the information about their individual devices and the general public will have access to some parts of the database and particularly some of the post-market and general safety information is now going to be required to be public. Um, how this is all going to be working is quite uh, hard to judge at the moment because the big challenge is that Udemed doesn't yet exist. It's a database that is yet to be fully developed um, and it's going to be a particular challenge uh, to get this up and running and working properly in time for the transition. 
and you'll get used to some new acronyms. So two new acronyms to learn, some new reports which are required under these regulations. The Periodic Safety Update Report, or the PSUR, and the Summary of Safety and Clinical Performance, the SSCP. These are new things uh, which all manufacturers are expected to produce, and according to your risk class, they'll be reviewed for the higher risk classes. Let's deal with the first one, Summary of Safety and Clinical Performance. This is what it is. It's a, a, it is a report, it is a summary um, of the following information. So firstly, you have to identify the device and the manufacturer, including the UDI, the Universal Device Identifier, um, and the registration number on the Udemed database. You need to exp um, state the intended purpose, the indications, contraindications, the use population, describe the device, um, including previous generations and variants and accessories and its history, and also compare uh, or at least summarize the possible diagnostic or therapeutic alternatives from other medical devices or other therapies to set it in the ecosystem in which it is used. Um, the summary needs to refer to the harmonized standards and common specifications that are complied with, and you need to summarize the clinical evaluation um, of the medical device. You don't need the full clinical evaluation report here, but there needs to be a summary of it, including relevant information on post-market clinical follow-up. Um, then the summary must also include details on the users of the device. In other words, who the device is intended to be used by, what is the profile of that user, and what level of training or expertise are they expected to have, ranging from none if it's for a lay use, something that's sold over the counter like a, a, an adhesive dressing, um, all the way up to um, a, um, a qualified um, surgeon for something that's used in uh, in cardiovascular surgery, for example. And then finally, you must document the other, the residual risks and the warnings and precautions that must be taken against the risks that couldn't, the risks that couldn't be designed out of the device. So that's a summary of safety and clinical performance. It's something that needs to be produced and then kept current. And then secondly, the periodic safety update report. Um, that uh, includes both uh, the, a summary of the results and conclusions of the post-market surveillance um, as well as the rationale and description of any preventative corrective actions that have resulted from post-market surveillance, um, or the justification for not acting, of course. Um, what are the benefit risk determinations from risk assessment? What are the main findings of the post-market clinical follow-up report? So the um, uh, the reports I've just been talking about. And then again, in terms of the user population, what are the volumes of sales and an estimate of the user population and usage frequency? So what we have here are a number of measurements that speak to safety and performance um, and uh, rates of failure or post-market events. And then we have the denominator um, of the volume of sales and the use population to give some together some incidence of the rate of um, of failures of devices in the marketplace, the rates of, um, of adverse events that occur. Um, now, this is going to be required for all devices apart from class one devices. It's going to be uh, required for every device or group of devices. If you've got groups of similar devices, you can write one report for them. Um, and it's something that has to be maintained throughout the device lifetime. And here are the reporting requirements. So for class three devices and all implants, um, whether they're class three or class two B, these reports need to be updated annually at least, um, and they need to be assessed by the notified body annually at least, in combination with a notified assessment, uh, notified body assessment of the updated clinical evaluation report. So if you've got a high risk class three device or an implantable medical device, you have three reports which will now requ be required to be reviewed every year by the notified body. That's three extra reviews um, and for which of course you'll be paying review fees. Um, for class 2b devices these reports must be updated annually but they don't have to be submitted to the notified body although they can be of course inspected on audit and for class 2a devices um, at least every two years or more frequently if it's appropriate. Again maintained in the technical file and again must be available to be reviewed by the notified body on request. So quite a lot more reporting here you can't um, get away with just having a post-market file and just collecting the data and not doing much with it. Extra notified body reviews and 
some of these reports uh, will need to be publicly available in some cases. So for devices that are over the counter um, and of particular interest uh, in terms of the potential risks, we're going to see uh, the need to have some of these, uh, particularly the summary of safety, um, uh, uh, published in the Udemed database and available publicly. So how do you deal with all this? We have three years for medical devices, five years for the IVDs. Um, what needs to be done and when? Well, if you're thinking about this, um, probably the best place to start is device classifications. Check whether any of your devices are caught uh, by the new classification rules and end up in new classes because you are going to need to be then talking to your notified body about new arrangements for conformity assessment review. Um, you will need to prepare a new general safety and performance checklist to replace your current essential requirements checklist. Um, and that's going to mean that you're going to need to deal with a whole lot more detail and provide a whole lot of inf extra information. That's going to then trigger an upgrade in the technical files which support that checklist, and especially the clinical evidence files. Post-market reporting processes are going to need to be upgraded across the board for pretty much all of us. So implement new post-market reporting processes that generate the um, summary reports that are going to go off to notified bodies or need to be held for time of audit and um, be, be uh, uh, a lot more rigorous about how you react to post-market information, how you justify your action or inaction and how you document it all. So all of these things mean talk to your notified body and plan because three years sounds a long time but in fact it's not much i'm going to talk about that just a moment about how difficult that's going to be there's a lot to do and the question is is there enough time so let's just look at the timelines. Um, now, those of you who uh, view these webinars regularly will have seen a version of this slide before, but I just want to uh, set this out and think about what it means in terms of the implementation. Now we know the actual dates and also uh, at the end, talk a little bit about some of the implications for the longer transition for the IVD regulations. So here's the time scale. Um, we've just uh, fired the starting gun uh, in May 2017 and um, that sets up a three-year transition period ending May 2020 for the medical device directives. Um, and uh, at the end of that, um, manufacturers will all have to be working to the directives. Uh, but there will be a grace period for product that may have been manufactured under the, um, uh, the directives, um, uh, which can be run out um, if they're in, already in the warehouse and in the supply chain. Uh, they can be run out after the end of the transition. So. Manufacturers can still operate under the directives for the, that five-year, uh, three-year transition period, but uh, by the end of it, you need to be operating under the IVD, uh, sorry, the medical device regulation. Now, notified bodies need to be able to assess manufacturers to the new regulations. But if you're thinking that you're going to steal a march and start now, the problem is that no notified body is yet designated under the new rules. So nobody is yet able to be assessed under the new regulations, even though they've been gazetted and they're now in place. And it's expected that that designation process is going to take some time. There have been estimates of something like 18 months. Um, there's been a lot of argument about how that's going to work because, of course, you can't um, give an unfair commercial advantage by designating one or two notified bodies early and then the others have to wait. Um, and the arrangements that are currently in place with the Commission is that this is going to be done as a group. Um, there will be a bunch of notified bodies who will all be uh, reviewed um, and then uh, those reviews will all be announced and the designations uh, made effective on the same day so there is no unfair commercial advantage of one notified body over another. Um, but we currently have, um, we're expecting to see a, a, a fairly large number of notified bodies seeking redesignation uh, down from the from the peak where at the height of, uh, of the number of notified bodies a little while ago there were more than 80. There's now probably less than 70 and they're disappearing as we speak. The smaller ones, that long tail, uh, many of them are um, self-selecting and, and withdrawing from the marketplace. But probably 50 will remain who will seek designation. Um, it's expected that they won't all be redesignated. In fact, some of the more pessimistic uh, estimates are that maybe 25 will succeed. So that will uh, end up more, uh, about a third of what was there originally. Now, that doesn't mean there's a third of the capacity because, of course, at the moment, the top 10 notified bodies probably account for 
more than 90 percent of the market and most of those are going to still be there so there will be still plenty of capacity in the marketplace but what is going to be interesting there's probably uh, a small number maybe only three to five will be fully certified to assess all class three devices and all categories of devices um, and this is going to be a slow process because there is one small team in the commission that's responsible for performing the designations and they can only work so fast so that means you know 18 months or so before we've got a, a functioning designation uh, a set of designated no notified bodies a functioning group of organizations that can start to assess against the new regulations that chews up about half of the transition period which means that um, we effectively have to recertify all of the CE mark devices in about an 18 month period because there's no grandfathering. Everybody has to be recertified under the new medical device regulation. So it is going to get kind of busy um, for that period from the end of 2018 onwards. And then once the transition is over, all manufacturing must be done under MDR certification after the end of transition. Now, of course, there's other things going on. Um, ISO 13485 is currently in the middle of transition over to ISO 2018. Um, by March next year, all new ISO certifications must be against the new 2016 version of the standard. And um, uh, that um, uh, standard will be fully implemented um, by early 2019. Uh, in Canada, of course, Canada has replaced its uh, Canadian Medical Device Conformity Assessment System um, auditing program uh, under CAMDECAS registrars, um, and they on uh, have, uh, Health Canada has declared that um, it will only accept uh, medical device single audit program um, certificates um, from the end of their transition date, which is actually at the end of 2018. So from the 1st of January 2019, uh, if you want to market in Canada, you're going to need a medical single medical device single audit program certificate um, and of course that affects a lot of manufacturers so um, transitions in the quality system space are taking up a lot of time at the same time that you're trying to deal with notified bodies who are transitioning to a new set of regulations now let's look at what that means for the IVD regulations because from that period of the end of 2018 through to the end of the medical device um, transition period it's going to be crazy busy there's not much time to do a lot for people to adopt to a new quality system standard if you're going into Canada to adopt to a new auditing paradigm and then adopting adapting your tele, uh, your technical files to the new medical device regulations there's a great deal to do in 18 months um, and notified bodies are going to be very busy working with manufacturers to get this all done um, and at the same time the IVD regulations are transitioning although taking a long period an extra two years I suspect it's going to be awfully busy towards the end of the medical devices transition and I wonder um, whether um, IVDs are going to feel the pinch and are going to be pushed a little bit further back down the queue because they have an extra period of time so it's yet to be seen how that's going to work and that's just a bit of speculation on my part but um, certainly as you can see there's a great deal going on all notified bodies have to be redesignated. A small number will be doing class three, a lot to do. Notified bodies are going to be overloaded. Manufacturers are going to be overloaded. Um, we're already seeing some notified bodies withdrawing to the center. Um, uh, SGS, for example, um, basically uh, pulled back from the Australian market recently and, and, um, and stopped supporting clients here um, and decided to focus on clients closer to home in Europe um, and in larger markets. And we might see more of that. So uh, it's important to plan now or be left out of the race. Make sure that you're working with a notified body that's going to be um, uh, reasonably expected to be redesignated. So that's um, as much as I've got to say. Thank you for joining um, joining me with this uh, uh, June 2, 2017 webinar. Um, the webinar has been recorded. It will be distributed along with a copy of the slides and question and answers. Um, we are here in Sydney. If you want to contact us, follow the details on the screen. Um, we also have our offices in uh, Beijing and Wellington. Um, and uh, if you can, would like to follow us in other ways, have a look at our website, follow me on Twitter, um, LinkedIn, um, and uh, also come to our website, our YouTube channel, where you'll find this and many other of our webinar recordings. Thank you again, and I look to, forward to joining you again in the next month's edition of the Brentwood Live webinar.